Hey smokers, Drago One here, and today we're going to be taking a very specific look at LEGO Island's music, and from more of a technical angle. I'm stoked and ready to smoke! LEGO Island was a game for mine and many others' childhoods that was, to put simply, frickin' amazing. It allowed for a free-roaming 3D experience, giving the player a whole lot of activities to do, such as pizza deliveries, race car building, racing, law enforcement, EMT work, the likes of which had never been seen before in a game. It was something that captured a lot of my attention and time as a kid. One of the most prominent features of the game was its extensive soundtrack. It was more than just some lame MIDI files. It was real music, with real instruments and real vocals. Something that makes the world of LEGO Island that much more immersive. Like this was a microcosm that had its own people and its own culture. It also had a jukebox where you could find songs that you could just as easily have heard on the radio in real life. And it also had a radio station. But being one of LEGO Island's hallmark features, the soundtrack suffered from an unfortunate problem. In order to fit all 1 hour and 13 minutes of audio, along with the game, onto the CD, the quality had to be lowered. Now this wouldn't be an issue today with our compression codecs such as MP3 and overall higher data density storage mediums, but back then those didn't exist and neither did the processing power to handle them easily. So the only way to shrink down PCM audio was to lower its sampling rate. This comes at a great cost to the audio quality, and this is exactly what the LEGO Island devs did. The LEGO Island soundtrack plays back at a sampling rate of just 11,025 Hz. That's one quarter of the sampling rate of Redbook audio that you hear from your average audio CD. It's also monaural, so that means that even less auditory information is getting to your brain. But even with such a huge drop in quality, the soundtrack still stands the test of time. Just recently I was listening to it while playing StarCraft II, randomly. I would like to think of myself as a bit of an audiophile. I'll always prefer a flak version of anything if I can get it. But if that's the case, why would I put up with something with such low quality? Well, the music is just good and enjoyable and reminds me of simpler times. The other reason was, I believe there was no other way to listen to the music. And for the most part, that is correct. But we'll get into that in a bit. In the 90s, a lot of games used Redbook Audio as the soundtrack for their games and enabled them to have studio quality recordings. That's right, 44,100 Hz, 16-bit, stereo. However, having such high quality meant you had to dedicate a lot of the space on the CD to the soundtrack. This worked for games like Rayman and other titles with a small amount of game data or simplistic soundtracks, which didn't use up all the data on the CD. And thus there was space to spare. Such was not the case with LEGO Island. You might condemn the devs for not using Redbook Audio for this fantastic soundtrack, but there are some reasons why that wouldn't have been a good idea. First of all, if they did decide to go Redbook, they wouldn't have been able to pack nearly as much music into the game. The max capacity of my LEGO Island disc is 566 megabytes, which means it was pressed in a time where that was probably the maximum amount of datage that an average CD could hold. Taking a look at the game's files, excluding the audio, account for 321 megabytes of data. This would only leave 244 megabytes for Redbook Audio, which is only about 23 minutes worth, which would mean the soundtrack would lose about three quarters of its content in duration. So since we're talking about unre-experienceable magical childhood memories here, I'd take more tunes over quality. Secondly, if you've ever played LEGO Island, you'd know that through any play session you might encounter five to seven tracks within just a few minutes of play, as your location determines the background music. Imagine having to wait as the game locks up while your slow 90s 1-4x CD-ROM drive seeks to the track to play for when you get to, say, the pizzeria, for instance. That wouldn't be fun, and any playtesters, even at the time, would probably find it intolerable. So you might think, well, just make the game not wait for the CD player. Just load it in the background. Well, that might be possible, but every game I've ever played usually locks up while it's waiting for disc access. But even if you got around that somehow, you'd still have a problem. When you're walking around the island, you might hear music pop in and out of being heard just as you pass something. That might just no longer happen since the CD drive is seeking like crazy trying to play all those snippets of audio as you walk around the island. Finding your minute-to-minute -minute experience somewhat silent aside from your optical drive sounding like it wants to die. As a kid, how are you going to know there's a scary secret cave somewhere if you can't ever hear the music cue as you walk by it? LEGO Island was designed to run off the CD. I found that out as a kid when I would eject the disc, the music would get stuck in a 50 millisecond buffer loop, and when it came back, all the game textures would be shuffled. 
This was because back then, people were just upgrading from Windows 3.1 to 95, and space was at a premium. My 3D Body Adventure CD had more capacity than the hard disk in the computer I played it on as a kid. CDs were just that badass, or at least cheaper to make than hard disks per megabyte. This is why LEGO Island's actual on-disk installation size is only like 13 megabytes. So if all data is going to be streamed off the CD, and data bandwidth is not exactly at a premium, having lower quality, smaller snippets of audio data makes more sense. And having a soundtrack that takes up less space means less actual surface area on the physical disk used for music. Which means the CD-ROM drive's reading laser doesn't have to move as much to cover the entire soundtrack. And with the low data rate per second needed to load in such a low sampling rate, it accesses the music data damn fast and with very brief actual interruption of the game. Most of the time, with no interruption at all. The total size of the 1 hour and 13 minutes of music in the game is a lean 94 megabytes. Which is actually smaller than my MP3 version of the soundtrack, and would have been 772 megabytes if it was Redbook quality audio with the same duration. But wait, something isn't adding up. If the game files are 321 megs, and the music is 94, then where's the other 150 megs of data? Well, here's where everything starts to make way more sense. There is 150 megabytes of dialogue audio, meaning there is a longer total duration of just characters talking than the entire soundtrack by about 30 minutes or so. And we all know how important that dialogue is. It wouldn't be Lego Island without those voices, those characters, that crazy storytelling. If you had to read what the characters had to say without their goofy dialogue, the game would have certainly suffered just to get an extra 14 minutes of music with our Redbook audio plan. Also, the bulk target demographic of this game probably can't read. This wasn't a last minute, oh shit, what do we do with the space situation. This was planned this way. Every kilobyte of space on that disc mattered, and they packed in way more than anybody really thinks about. Now at this point, the math on these numbers is getting pretty shaky. And for a few reasons. First of all, I'm pretty bad with math. Second of all, LEGO Island's dialogue file has a different sampling rate than the music at only 6,000 Hz. And third, both sampling rates I'm listing might be a bit inaccurate. If you go and listen to the raw PCM data from these files, you'll hear some music and some dialogue if you import them with the respective settings, but you'll also hear a large chunk of what can only be described as ear rape. This ear rape is non-PCM data of some kind that, when played back, sounds like static from the fiery depths of hell. It may be file header data, it may be part of a proprietary compression scheme I'm not aware of, or it could just be the nature of importing any kind of raw data like this without really tweaking the import settings properly. I'm really not sure. But it makes my aforementioned audio duration numbers inaccurate because they include these blocks of ear rape data. We'll stick with these numbers anyway, just to keep things consistent. Now to get back on track, this all worked out fine for the time. Lego Island got released with its 1 hour and 13 minutes of music, and we ended up cherishing it from our childhood. But if we ever want to go back, we're reminded of just how bad the quality of the soundtrack is. There's been no official release of the music from Lego in higher quality. Lego Island's 20th anniversary came and went with nothing that I know of. And I suppose you could hold out for the 25th anniversary in 2020, and hope they announce something but they probably won't. And here's why. I did a very small bit of research for this video, which is really rare for me since it's often the reason a video doesn't get made, because I find out someone has already talked about all of this, which just makes me feel like I wasted all of my time. But if I don't research, I look like an idiot. Well, let's be honest, that just happens regardless. Well, within 30 seconds of the start of my research, I found out that one of the original musicians had released WAV files from the original tapes used in the game's production. Yes. 44,100 hertz, 16-bit, stereo. Over 400 megabytes of PCM audio were released. When I first heard the full quality versions of this music, I was blown away. it sounds like an entirely different recording, almost as if someone remade it or covered it. It's remarkable what the brain does to fill in the gaps when you're a kid. Now, not all the tracks are full quality. There are some audio quality issues with the actual physical tape due to deterioration over time, more so than the actual digital audio quality by the numbers. 
Some tracks are not even their final versions, or they're incomplete. And others weren't even used in the final game. It's kind of a look behind the scenes at LEGO Island that I never thought I'd be able to experience. If you want to check it out, the link is in the description. So that settles it then. The soundtrack is out in full quality, and the day is saved. But I also learned something tragic. Apparently, the original master tapes were lost in some sort of houseboat accident. And this is only an archive of tapes that were saved by the original musician. And that's all that's left. And it's by no means all the songs, since there were several musicians and not just one. There are still some that might be out there somewhere, but probably not. And that brings me to Project Island, the same website hosting the high quality music, which I didn't know about until I started working on this video. It's a group of people trying to make a fan-made final LEGO Island game in the series to take Pepperoni on one final adventure. It says on the website, you'll be able to create your own adventure and do all the fun things the island has to offer however you please. You can become the fastest pizza deliverer on the planet, or just chill around the beach all day. It's up to you. And they're even looking for help with game development, so if you have some artistic or coding skill, you might want to drop them a line if you're interested. I sent them a message saying that I've already made some LEGO Island inspired music, but they haven't gotten back to me yet. Probably because they already have a musician. Well, that's it. The mystery behind it all has been solved. We've learned that some things are just forever lost to time, while the memories of the experience of music in that game will live on far beyond what any of the musicians probably ever thought about. It was just their day job, after all. Personally, when it comes to music and games, I routinely end up getting a longer duration of enjoyment out of just the music in a game than actually playing the game itself. As a kid, I would use my dad's portable CD player to directly listen to the Red Book audio off of my computer game discs such as Sonic R, Earthworm Jim 1 and 3D, Rayman, Age of Empires, Frogger 1 and 2, Breakout, and probably quite a few more. It was an exciting discovery finding out that there was instant access to my favorite tracks just by pressing play and avoiding track one, the data track, the true, true ear rape. That some newer CD players can detect and automatically isolate and mute, but the older ones, they, they, they don't. Track 2, kids. I always start with track 2. In fact, I didn't realize this until now. Usually, when I encounter a new album, I usually start with track 2, maybe 3. Is that because I want to get to the meat of the album first and avoid a possible intro track? Or is it PTSD from the data track on game discs? Oh my god. But not all games had Redbook or PCM Audio. Some of them had some weird DirectX MIDI sort of stuff that I need to research more. I could talk about that in another video, possibly. But games like LEGO Racers 1 and LEGO Island 2 seem to have used it, but others didn't. And that's not mentioning MIDI or Tracker, which is a whole other subject. LEGO Racers 2 actually stores its audio the exact same way LEGO Island 1 does, raw PCM data. Just bigger files, higher quality, and longer duration. And the practice of using uncompressed raw PCM data as game audio is still not lost to the current generation. Titanfall 1 came with 35 gigabytes of uncompressed audio. And this was supposedly to save on CPU usage since running a decoder like MP3 or OGG actually does take up more CPU cycles than just playing back raw PCM. And I guess they figured they had the space to do it. The way they did it was they compressed the data on disk and then decompressed it during installation, which gave some gamers a very long decompression time to unpack all 35 gigs of the PCM audio. Well, thanks everybody for watching and listening to me talk about stuff that I probably don't understand. For more videos with an inconsistent release schedule and unpredictable subject matter, keep it locked to Draga 1.